Hello and welcome. Kia ora, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, I'm Barry Coates, uh, founder and CEO of Mindful Money. Uh, we're a charity that enables the public to use their money as a force for good. Uh, we have a series of seminars underway, a series of weekly seminars all at this time, 4 p.m. on a uh, 4 p.m. on a Thursday. And uh, this is the sixth in the series. I encourage you to find out about the other five by going on to Mindful Money's website, having a look under, under events. Um, we've been focusing on ethical investing during the COVID crisis, and now we're shifting gears. And this is, of course, budget day. And we're focusing more on uh, investing sustainably for the, for the future of New Zealand. Um, this... Uh, seminar is, is responding to the government's budget. This is obviously one of the most significant budgets that we will experience in our lifetime. And uh, so I, uh, we've got a fantastic panel joined uh, to, to uh, discuss this. So I welcome uh, Abby Reynolds. Uh, Abby's perhaps best known as former director of Sustainable Business Council, is also a member of Westpac's Sustainability Advisory Council. Uh, David Hall, uh, David's a, uh, um, uh, a fantastic academic with uh, qualification from Oxford University and uh, a founding director of, of Mahaya Research Institute and senior uh, researcher at AUT's Policy Observatory. Um, and welcome to Bridget, uh, Bridget Coates, uh, Chair of Koi2, the Centre for Informed Futures. She's a member of Fonterra's Sustainability Panel uh, and former Director of Reserve Bank uh, and the uh, New Zealand Superannuation Fund, so well qualified to, to discuss these issues. So uh, great panel and thank you very much for joining us. Um, for all of you, um, I'm afraid you're going to be muted. Uh, during the call, uh, but use the Zoom group chat to, to enter uh, any questions, comments uh, as we go along. And then uh, after we've gone for around 25 minutes, uh, we'll switch over uh, to the questions and comments and we'll have a dialogue on those. For those of you on Facebook Live, uh, welcome. And please use the comments uh, in Facebook in order to put any questions and, and my colleague Toby will uh, put them into the Zoom call and we'll address those questions and comments as well. So without further ado, let's uh, jump into it. Um, so maybe Abby, if you wanna kick us off, um, from your perspective, uh, how is the budget compared to your expectations? Look, I think it's, it's not far off what I was expecting, Barry, but you know, I think when we when you work in the space of sustainability, you spend a lot more of your time living in a place of hope. So there were some things I hoped they might get to. Um, I was really hoping that this budget might be kind of transformational, a, a real opportunity to think about leveraging this moment in time to help us transition to a much lower carbon economy and a lower carbon way of living. Um, better focus on biodiversity and really making sure we're dealing with the fundamental structural issues that mean we end up with communities in poverty or disadvantage or without housing. Um, so those were my hopes, but I think the budget itself probably ended up about where I expected it to. So, you know, a real focus on jobs and making sure that um, people have good work and um, probably not enough in my mind focus on the longer term issues, which we see coming down the line around biodiversity and climate change. Kara, thank you. Uh, David. Yeah, my thoughts are, are similar. What I was expecting. I mean, I I think about the this in in terms of the wellbeing framework. You know, this is pitched as the second wellbeing budget, um, and the wellbeing framework involves present wellbeing as well as future wellbeing. And and given the crisis that we're in the middle of, it's hardly any surprise that the weighting is towards um, present well-being at this time, as Abby was saying, uh, things like jobs and so on. And I guess, um, yeah, I mean, one perhaps surprise there was just 
the, the lack of infrastructure commitments, given that the conversation so far has had a real heavy emphasis on shovel ready infrastructure. Um, and that's obviously points us more towards the future well-being. So those choices that are going to be made for that infrastructure are vital. And I guess um, that the, the recovery fund has has fifty billion dollars um, allocated um, appropriated for that, but but there's twenty billion that hasn't yet been allocated. And so there's obviously a, a placeholder there that we might see some further detail emerge. And um, so perhaps that is where more of that infrastructure is going to come out and perhaps um, we'll have to have another conversation in the future about whether that's pointing in the right direction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So some some uh, some fairly big unknowns. I think there was a, a 3 billion addition this time and uh, uh, projects yet to come. Uh, Bridget. So um, very similar thoughts about the balance between um, meeting the current uh, desperate needs and, and thinking more aspirationally and more structurally and strategically. Uh, and, you know, somewhat disappointed that there, there wasn't much colour around that. But, um, but then again, uh, you know, this is very early days, a lot of money unallocated, as you said. And so, uh, you know, there's, there's plenty of room to hopefully uh, get to uh, something more aspirational and bolder and braver um, in terms of medium term issues. But, you know, I found myself reflecting on how incredibly fortunate uh, we are that we're raising this sort of money in an environment of, uh, of zero or very low interest rates. Um, you know, latest government bond tender was just so low. And, you know, if it wasn't for that, um, I think we'd all be in a completely different frame of mind and probably much more perturbed about the scale of what's being done here. But uh, it is a very fortunate time to be able to borrow and spend uh, in this way at this scale at this time. Yeah, that's a really interesting point because, uh, you know, not only do we have headroom with, with currently low debt levels, but also that point about being able to borrow at, uh, at you know, when when the Reserve Bank's got a, a you know, 0.25% uh, base rate is, uh, uh, makes a large deficit affordable, uh, certainly in the short term. And, yeah. and mm -hmm. I guess the question is, is, so what does that look like further down, down the track? Sure. Um, I, I'm, I was struck by uh, Grant Robertson's uh, lead in to the budget, uh, where he said, uh, we'll rebuild our economy and our country to be better than it was before, um, to be the country we've always said we want it to be. And, you know, that's a that's a, a pretty aspirational, sounds, as you said, Abby, like, like something uh, transformational. I think what we ended up with was much more of a jobs budget. Yeah. Within that, there was some interesting stuff. Do you, do you, do you each want to give us uh, two or three things about the budget that, that do you think uh, are really, you know, really resonated with you and you, that you think are important? The, our hot hits, the bits of yeah, the top, top tips, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, since I'm speaking, I'll start. Um, look, I, there's no there's no going past a, um, a $1 billion investment in environmental jobs for me. Uh, that's pretty exciting and a really clear focus on habitat protection, pest control and biodiversity. Um, so very excited about that. It, the, the speech talks about it mostly being on public lands, but also talks about working with farmers. So kind of, again, we come back to the ambiguity about where that will be spent. So that was that was something I kind of really got a bit excited about. Um, I got a bit obsessed with other details, so excuse me for diving into some of them. Um, a, the talk about investment in transport and infrastructure, which has already been discussed, but you know it's now turning up in this budget and replacing our ferries. So when I start thinking about things about our low carbon transition, you know, trains and ferries and whether they're electric or our legacy and run by fossil fuels is something we need to be paying attention to. So those are things I will be looking for. And then the other thing that I think is super important is um, our young people. And so lots and lots of reference to looking after young people, which did give me a real sense of hope. Um, uh, one area that particularly matters to me is investing in kids who are in foster care and there's um, some uplifts and funding in that area, which is really good news. Um, some really good investment in training and development for young people. That's really important. We know there's a 
We know there's a gap between what employers want and where young people are, so filling that gap and funding good organisations to do that matters. Um, so those were some of the things which gave me real hope. And the fact that the child poverty indicators are in there, you know, despite the fact we're in this kind of emergency, that that hasn't been lost, lost sight of. So did I did have a few quite good, you know, hot hits despite my, you know, disappointment about it's not quite being as transformational as I'd like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Tough time to be transformational, I think, in a way, in a way with the other short-term pressures on. Don't, um, come on, Harry. Don't you the hook. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Was ever, was ever thus. Dave. Yes, I was also similarly pleased to see the one point one dollars, one one point one billion um, investment in environment jobs, and I. I was really hoping, and that was a pleasant surprise to see that come through because I felt like other than a lot of um, infrastructure investments where there would have been a lot of delays potentially and a lot of time taken to actually get the shovels in the ground, um, despite the optimistic promises that they would be shovel ready. Um, the, the, the environmental jobs, you know, really can claim that and you really can get people working quite quickly and you can get people uh, working in a lot of different regions and different places in cities as well. And so there will be jobs available where um, people are falling out of jobs, out of tourism, out of retail, out of um, hospitality and so on. So there, there, there's a really good alignment there um, bet between people who need jobs and, and jobs being available in, in, that, in that green job space. So I was pleased to see that and to see, you know, that again, that sort of placeholder for some of that larger infrastructure where some of the planning might get a chance to, to be done in the meantime. Um, and, and, and as Abby said, it, it's unclear as to how that's going to be um, actualized um, or, or implemented um, and, and whether some of that's been done on private land, but I, but I truly hope that it will be. And, and one reminder of why that is because you know, you know the, the North Island drought financial assistance was in um, the budget as well. Some of the money that they've already spent, but also some other allocations um, for the remainder of the year. And that's just a reminder of, of how exposed we are to climate related risks. This was a really unusual drought. Um, and, you, you know, it's kind of been superseded by uh, events subsequent, but, you know, that was already expected to have a substantial impact on GDP given its impact on um, agricultural exports. So, so that is a reminder of why it's so important to, um, to, to get engaged in these environmental jobs because, because that can start to um, you know, diversify uh, land use and, and also you know, build some resilience into the land. And another thing that I picked up on was um, a new budget line uh, for decarbonisation of the state sector. So uh, already with the New Zealand up upgrade program, there was um, a pledge to put more money into replacing uh, coal burners and so on, you know, with heat pumps and, and schools and things, but that's been also extended to um, other publicly owned buildings, including hospitals. And, um, and that's quite important actually because hospitals um, the health sector is is estimated to to contribute about three to eight percent of New Zealand's carbon dioxide emissions. So, it is actually a large source of emissions, and we are rightly uh, investing a lot more into the public health system as a result of of the pandemic. Um, and we need to make sure that you know that growth in the health sector doesn't uh, contribute to an expansion of its emissions. And you know, hopefully. Um, there's a bit of a strategy, a sustainability strategy involved there. The, 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 the Ministry of Health published a paper on this last year, um, but hopefully we can have, um, you know, growth in the public health system, which doesn't entail a growth in its emissions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Uh, Bridget, what occurs to you? So um, not to repeat the, uh, the really good points that uh, the other panelists have made, but um, the affordable housing, five billion, um, uh, eight thousand additional houses. Um, you know, when I look at what is that, uh, fifteen billion in total infrastructure. Um, one would hope that 
you know, the 5 billion in housing might actually hopefully go up uh, once that, um, that 8,000 uh, gets underway through Kaiago or most of it, which um, I, you know, and, and others. So hopefully, you know, addressing, addressing poverty to me is a, is a huge amount about finding affordable housing and uh, addressing the housing issue uh, once and for all. So that's a really good move. Um, hopefully more, as I said. Uh, the other one uh, that was interesting is the food security school lunch program expanded to 200,000 children, which is apparently virtually all of deciles one to four uh, would be eligible for free school lunch. So, and, uh, and a significant number of jobs, I guess 2000 jobs created as a result of the expansion of that program. Um, it's a measure of, I, I guess, uh, how much uh, that support is needed uh, in our communities at the moment that, um, that this, uh, this program is being so rapidly expanded after only being recently started and now having expanded uh, to 200,000 children. And the third point, uh, which is something I was just reflecting on with regard to COVID is, you know, how we've let our public sector um, expenditure run down, um, especially in the health uh, and things like, you know, the immigration department being restricted to using paper and pen uh, when they were they're challenged by COVID. They, they actually found out that the, some of these departments are just woefully, woefully behind in terms of technology and in terms of investment. And so um, there's a big, quite a big chunk of money going towards our core public sector and you know, we can't have economic justice or anything very much if we don't have a good public sector to, to um, that's well uh, well set up to uh, to support um, the, uh, the these initiatives. So I'm um, I'm I was really gratified to see that. Yeah, it was uh, the structure of the budget was was that there was a pre-announcement on uh, of four billion for for health and and a billion for education. I I, I agree that uh, it's great to see some some long overdue catch-up funding going into our core public services because I think we weren't well prepared and uh, it's due to the kind of dedication of, of the public services that we were able to get through the COVID crisis and, and uh, um, it would be great to have that reinvestment uh, in our core public services in future. The other, the other thing that we haven't mentioned uh, or, or, or not much is there's a lot of stuff around the trades and apprenticeship training uh, mm -hmm. scattered through different initiatives, including a number of programs at community level and, and with Māori and, and Pacifica. And I thought that was uh, uh, that was absolutely necessary because um, if people are going to need, you know, if people are going to kind of reskill up for for the jobs that emerge from this crisis, then that training will be absolutely essential. Um, so um, let's change gears and uh, put your critical brain on and say, what were you really disappointed about? What was uh, what was missing? Uh, David, do you want to kick us off with your with your tough message? Sure. Um, I mean, I mean, I guess there's two ways of looking at this, isn't there? There's the um, you know do no harm or, or doing good, you know, there's the negative screen mm -hmm. and the positive screen and responsible investment <laughs> language. Um, and, and, you know, I, I haven't been through with a fine tooth comb yet, um, but, I, but nothing really stands out too much on the, do, you know, do no harm side. Uh, um, you, you know, there's nothing obviously there which screams, um, of, of the you know this is going to lock us into the lock us into a high emissions economy there you know it's to some extent that had already been done with the allocation to um to roading through the new zealand upgrade program in january um but there was no further you, you know further allocations to roads but but yeah i mean the disappointing bit is obviously on the do good side there's just nothing really there from a from a climate change perspective and 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 minimal there um from a for, for in the in that intergenerational well-being side i mean it's very much focused on the present um apart from the, you know the the 1.1 million for um for the environmental jobs you know obviously that's going to contribute to net make a large contribution to natural infrastructure which will indeed set future generations in in, in better stead 
Um, but yeah, it, there there is is nothing there really that, that that seems to reinforce that transformational tag which the prime minister, for better or worse, has um, has settled herself with. And um, you know that is consistent with the the last uh, budget as as well. I I wrote a piece for the conversation on that and 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 used some of the. Um, the, the frameworks from sustainable development and you know where where the government fits in is much more in in in, in what is called a, a sort of transitional approach so it's certainly not with the status quo and it's not um, content with business as usual and in that sense there is a real change and there is a sense of dynamism with this government but it doesn't live up to that promise of transformational which is very much defined in terms of um, you know, new systems or, or replacing existing institutions with new ones. And there's nothing, nothing much in that way that, that, um, that seems to define a more transformational government. So, so it sort of reinforces that this is much more a government of transition than transformation. Mm -hmm. uh, Bridget. Um, totally agree. And uh, there's, a, you know, certainly lots of examples. I, the, the, uh, Grant uh, said some uh, comments about collaboration and co-creation and working with others. Um, I listened to the Epidemic Response Committee yesterday and Iwi were complaining about the fact that they have been marginalised um, over right through the whole COVID period and uh, that there just has not been um, a good good consultation of you know too much uh, decision making in Wellington and not enough reaching out. Uh, business would have um, many businesses would have a similar comment. Uh, so, I guess you know, for me, there's two big um, big things that you know one could worry about. Um, one is that you know uh, uh, consultation, collaboration, co-creation, and those because we are all in this together. They did you know they have have the words, but but whether they've got the actions um, uh, and. Um, and the other is the quality of the spend and how you go from, you know, what we're spending at the moment to this, this very much higher level of spend, whether the infrastructure is there, whether it's going to be well, um, well managed, good quality spend. Uh, you know, we are, we're not a big country and we have to every dollar it matters. And so uh, I think, um, you know, one would, would worry about that. The other thing, I, I think we're going to have some cries from people uh, in uh, uh, Fano Ora and others because the number, the dollars into those welfare areas were very, very modest. Um, yeah. And the and no attempt to address any of the issues out of the welfare report. So I think there's going to be communities uh, who will who will be quite um, disappointed in, in that sort of area. Um, Abby. I'd like to, yeah, absolutely agree with both what David and Bridget have said. And actually, building on your point, Bridget, I read, I read the speech, um, and was I think really surprised actually by the absence of any dialogue about being in partnership with Māori, like that that this would be a tativity based kind of budget. That really surprised me. I thought there would be more of an emphasis on partnering, particularly in the regions, and um, working with Māori on really innovative ways of investing. You know, there's allocations for Māori, but it's much more focused on kind of support for them rather than, you know, um, empowering them up to be part of leading our recovery. So that came as a bit of a surprise. Um, and and I'd been sit hearing the same things, you know, from the Epidemic Response Committee about them being left out. I think the other thing that um, I'm a bit curious about is um, the community sector. And I think it's carved up in different ways in the budget, but one of the things which is um, going to be a real challenge for New Zealand is our community sector, which is all of our charitable organisations. You know, a bunch of them deliver core services for, you know, us. Like, you know, it, it's easy to forget that St John's is a charity and, yes, it might get 60 to 70% of the, you know, ambulance costs that it provides covered, but it's not all of it. And the charitable community sector is going to struggle probably more than just about any, and that just seems to be consistently missing. Um, and part of the reason, I think, is because they just aren't set up and funded to have a loud voice. So one of the things which made me curious as I was reading the budget was, you know, how much of the budget responds to those who've got the loudest voices and the, the, the greatest ability to... Um, to really communicate what they might need. You know, we've had really good support for business. And I think, you know, that's because they're good at talking about what they need, but that might not be true across all parts of um, New Zealand society. 
Um, one thing I did actually notice, which I was really was pleased about, and I know we're meant to having a black hat on, but at the moment was that um, was also the kind of recognition that uh, you know online productivity mattered, and so that there's some funding in there for NZT to help our businesses do better with e-commerce, and I think that for me felt like a really nice opportunity to build on what we've learned from having to all be, you know, on these sorts of platforms and working from home. So another nice little kind of piece in here about you know, how we can improve productivity. Yep. So to your point about whose voice gets listened to, the, the piece that I really, really was surprised at is there's so little in here for people who are doing it really hard through this. You know, there was talk about a UBI or some kind of helicopter payment to households to be able to have a demand-led recovery where people could go out and spend their money, but the money's gone to business, it hasn't gone to their households. And particularly, uh, the benefit hasn't been inc increased. And, and, you know, at a time we're going from 4.2% unemployment up to a projection of 9.8%, there are so many people who are going to be newly unemployed. They're going to be receiving benefits if they're single of $281 a week versus if it's a wage subsidy, it's $585 a week. And, you know, over the media, there's been people saying $585 a week. I can't live off that, let alone the people who, who are doing it really hard. On the, on, on the benefits we have. And I, I just, uh, I, I'm, I'm a little bit surprised that that, that hasn't happened, that, that there hasn't been this, this welfare reform that has been so strongly signaled. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so to me, that, that was a missing piece and, and there's a whole lot of other reforms of the benefit system that, that were highlighted by the export, expert group that also haven't been actually. Um, so for those of you on uh, our group chat and on Facebook, we're, we're coming to the end of our, um, our discussion and uh, we'll, we'll deal with questions. So, so uh, now would be a good time to put your questions in, in the group chat. If you're on Facebook Live, uh, please put them in the comments section and, uh, and they'll get transferred over onto, onto Zoom. Um, so a last question for, for you all, and let's make this a, a quick round, uh, starting with Bridget. Um, overall, so what's the prospect here of, of uh, this budget as a contributor towards the sustainability, the building back better? What, what's your, your overall assessment in terms of, of the future pathway? So um, I think, I, you know, Abby, Abby started us off with exactly what I would see, which is, um, you know, sort of operational managerial um, emphasis, you know, task or screen type of emphasis, some good, um, some good uh, initiatives. But, you know, in terms of overall strategic initiatives, uh, you know, um, electrification or renewable energy or, uh, you know the marine environment or anything uh, that that uh, that we have to do uh, that you know are all critical for building a sustainable New Zealand in the future. Um, you know, no, um, and maybe it's not fair uh, to expect it, uh, and that that's the sort of pass um, at the moment. But one would be looking for it uh, in the next budget or sooner. Yeah, Abby, um, I give it a five and a half out of ten. I think Barry. Um, you know, it, just building on Bridget's point, no, no reference to regenerative um, agriculture or um, you know circular economy either. So yeah, it, I, the the system shift stuff that we need to see to make those transitions just isn't referenced there, and that's what I'm looking for. David, yeah, I mean, I think I think there's partial. It, it it's a partial. Um, path <laughs> partially gets us onto the path but I mean it, to, to, to comprehensively see it I mean um, I think of this report that I wrote about for the spin-off yesterday the beyond growth report and it sort of talks about four goals of environmental sustainability improved well-being greater resilience and addressing inequality and you know there's bits of bits of sustainability you know good focus on present well-being 
uh, bits around resilience, but as you rightly said, um, Barry, the inequality piece is really missing nothing in regards to tax reforms and 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 no changes to transfers either, especially just a, pr a prolonging of some of those mechanisms that were already in place. And so, um, and and the problem is, you know, this the COVID crisis just shows how important that equality is for resilience in facing shocks like this, and how important it's going to be in facing. Um, future shocks as well from, from climate and from other sorts of um, unexpected events. And um, certainly New Zealand is, is better in some regards and we're in a better position in some regards than other countries, you know, such as the US, I think is obviously, a, you know, an obvious point of contrast there. But um, yeah, it would have been great to see more improvement on the equality front, I think. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess uh, the one thing that, that uh, um, is the context for this is is that uh, this is very much a short term. You know, let's let's get everyone working again. Deal with jobs as a top priority, and this twenty billion dollars yet unallocated, and three billion dollars of infrastructure projects uh, uh, that that are still um, un, unspecified. Um, so on to group uh, group chat uh, questions. Kevin asks around. The $3 billion of unallocated infrastructure projects. Um, any particular things that you would want them to see spend uh, their $3 billion on? Just quick uh, one or two favourites. Electrification and rail. Right. Yep. Dave, David? Yeah, it, it would be good to see some um, renewable energy projects, um, but but understanding that 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 is on a slightly slower time frame, so it is perhaps good that that's that space has been held rather than rushing in. Bridget, um, decarbonisation uh, and really looking at uh, regenerative agriculture and what we can do there, and we've got there's got to be a lot of answers there. Yeah. I think the, the sort of $3 billion unallocated is, is, uh, is, is one thing. Anything else in the, in the kind of big juicy 20 billion, you know, when, you know, if you're talking about being able to move to the next stage and the sort of rebuild, anything else that you'd, you'd love to see in terms of specific initiatives? I think the thing that always strikes me when I read these, and I think it's a point Bridget made as well, is the where does the kind of long-term strategic thinking come into this? And it's probably not the the budget's probably not the place, but actually the you know the piece which has always felt like it's missing for me is the really strategic view about how we move things and people and goods around the country. You know, an integrated ports, rail, roading, and coastal shipping network like that stuff. Um, how we think it because that's just that's where so much of our kind of physical infrastructure comes together. So for me, a really solid piece of thinking that kind of helps us navigate what that will need to look like with the obvious context of the huge uncertainty we'll have around um, what's going to happen on a whole bunch of those technologies. But yeah, that for me feels like something important, but not necessarily something you'd see signaled in a budget. Yeah. I'm aware that there was a previous prime minister who uh, proposed the national cycleway and, and it almost feels like we need something a bit totemic in order to uh, to get uh, get behind. Uh, I know the Greens uh, um, promoted a, a fast rail network across the country and, and environmental restoration. Bridget, David, anything anything particularly totemic that you're you're hanging out for? Well, I mean, I mean, just to riff off that, some of the obvious things that that you know sustainability oriented people would usually advocate. I think there is some caution required, especially public transport, I think. You know, we really need to see how the, the pandemic plays out. You know, what are the features of the virus? Because all of this is gonna have implications for how people use public transport and so on. And so some of those things that we might want to have rushed into, I think, I think it's good in, in some ways that they have been missing because there is a bit of time required to see if that's actually you know, the giant totem that we want to put all our eggs in. And I mean, I think that's why I focus on renewable energy because there is, you know, obvious opportunities there for, um, for, for, for some big, you know, energy projects, whether it's wind farms or whether it's, you know, massive um, rolling out of solar and, and, and so on. I mean, you know, you know those could be totemic, totemic um, 
um, investments which which don't have that same question around you know how we engage in a um, in a in a in a COVID world. Okay, Bridget, anything to add? No, thanks. No, nothing further. Thanks. Okay, so um, there's a suggestion that um, uh, uh, that the focus on the wage subsidy uh, means that uh, um, households aren't uh, aren't necessarily supported through through this crisis. Suggestion that uh, maybe there should also be an opportunity to move employers towards a living wage uh, and uh, maybe put an onus on on employers to to uh, take on job more stringent job uh, obligations in return for the wage subsidy. Um, any comments on on that perspective? Abby, anything? Uh... Yeah, it, I mean, I guess I, is that the job of a budget? You know, I think part of it is about carrots and sticks right and so if we want our businesses to be you know holding on to people and paying them a living wage then what are the what are what's the you know infrastructure that sits around them to enable them to do that you know it's a difficult time for businesses and so you can see that that would have an uneven impact across the different sectors so i think that's a harder one to answer in principle absolutely we want people to be able to be on the living wage what are the mechanisms for doing that i don't think i know David probably yeah. better at answering these sorts of questions than I am. That was a hospital pass if ever I saw one, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, question for you, David, in the uh, in the, in the uh, chat on on Facebook. Um, I think about institutional reform, the kind of changes that are not necessarily budget but complementary to the budget. Are there any innovative institutional arrangements that you think could rapidly be put in place? Uh, while we're in a reset phase. Oh, that's interesting. Um, my 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 mind um, my mind goes to some of the work that the EDS, the Environmental Defence Society, has recently been doing on on the RMA, the Resource Management Act, but also even more thinking how we might. Um, better organize all of these large, large pieces of legislation um, to, to sort of, you know, improve some of their synergies and, and, and uh, reduce some of the conflicts and, um, and give them a bit more coherence and sense to them. And, and part of that as well is, is building it around a, a futures commission um, or some kind of entity that really takes seriously these uh, future problems. I know this is something that Professor Jonathan Boston has also yeah. talked about a lot, and I, I think I think the the shock of the COVID um, crisis mm -hmm. is another reminder of how important something like this is that really has a mandated job to think about these sorts of shocks um, and and to anticipate them and to remind politicians that these are real possibilities. They're not just um, you know fictions of <laughs> of our worst imaginations or our worst worries or these you know bullets that, that, that we can dodge, you know, that, that they really are going to hit us. And, and unfortunately, because of some of the um, effects of our sort of hyper globalized age and, um, and our increasingly climate influenced age, you know, a warm, warming, heating up era. Um, yeah, so, some, of, some of these risks are, are more likely to occur and they're more likely to be intense when they when they do occur and so having some organization that really had that job at its core to think about these risks and to think about ways that we can reduce our exposure as a nation to these risks and also to um, anticipate them and improve our resilience I mean I think I think that would be something um, transformational that, that could come out of the current crisis. Yeah uh, Bridget for, for you you know this the, the budget is all about money, but but typically money needs to work alongside policy and and as we've just discussed institutional reform. Do you have have any any kind of feelings of the kind of policies that you see would be complementary with the budget and would would really help get the economy back on track as well as meet some of those long term challenges? 
Um, look, I, I just think David was, uh, with well, a question before about institutional arrangements um, is so uh, pertinent because, you know, we, we've been doing, through Koi2, we've been doing a lot of work on what is actually going on across the board in the environmental area and sustainability and adding up everything. And when you sort of put it all together, there's a vast amount of initiatives going on in all sorts of parts of the country. And yet it doesn't sum, it doesn't sum up um, it, there isn't an overall narrative that holds it together. It gives it some aspiration and some consistency and coherence. And so, again, David's pointed, you know, an overall overarching commission or a, 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 a committee for the future, a, a modification of the climate, um, climate commission to take, take a broader sustainability perspective. I mean, I think there's something we're missing that would be aspirational, future oriented and and create some frameworks for us all to be more positive and more confident about the way that we're investing uh, public money and our uh, and and business money in in uh, in this direction that is uh, really resonant of the call coming from many iwi leaders for saying that we need a you know we, we don't need a short term planning we we actually need a context a 40 year vision and and if we really are to be kaitiaki for for the future of, of, of our environment and, and our society, then we need to have that generational perspective. And, and so that very much speaks to the future commission, to, to the thinking ahead. So uh, um, uh, along those lines is a um, question in, in, uh, uh, in chat from, from Patrick, which um, is, he notes that, that uh, uh, the Matikimai group and others have, in, have called for the initiation of a conversation on constitutional transformation. And it may seem counterintuitive that this would be the right time to do it. But the question is, you know, actually, could this be exactly the right time to start this con conversation? Could this be an enabler of saying, and, and you know, you rightly pointed out in the panel that that uh, we need to have a a, a, a far deeper engagement uh, with the partnership principles of Te Tariti. Is this is this the time to do that to look at our our constitution, Abby? Man, that's a big question, isn't it? Um, I can see pros and cons. I think for me, it comes down to the fact that what I find so useful about um, being a New Zealander and getting to be adjacent to Te Ao Māori is that it's got a holistic perspective and when you work in sustainability so much of what Te Ao Māori offers us are the answers and so um, that to me does seem helpful if we're looking at Tatiriti and saying what is our constitutional framework and how does that fit and what would it mean for all of the ways we think about everything you know so much of so many of the challenges we face from a systems point of view, the, the systemic issues of, you know, Western thought or, um, you know, capitalism or, you know, the patriarchy, you know, having the opportunity to use a different worldview to kind of challenge some of those and bring them into consciousness and make other choices feels really useful to me. So um, I like the idea, the practicalities of it might be like, you know, super challenging, but it, it, yeah, definitely a helpful part of the conversation. David? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, th this that would be a great outcome, a vital outcome out of this. But unfortunately, this is just the time that it never really happens in the middle of an emergency. And this is what part of the tragedy of emergency and emergency politics is that, is that um, you know, governments are in a rush, they're urgent, they're, they're bombarded by information and, and crisis um, solving. And, and that's exactly when their relationships with others gets put to one side and run over the top of. And, um, you know, this is why some of us, including myself, have always been wary of using climate emergency as a, as a framing for climate action, because it, it sort of incentivizes this, this rush um, that, that, that often, you know, neglects relationships um, and especially relationships with our treaty partner um uh, the the relationships of the crown and the treaty partner and you know it has a long history obviously going back to the public works act and um uh it, you know my colleague on on the auckland climate action framework um dr reese jones has written about how 
um, you know, the response to the COVID crisis, you know, that even th th there's been a lack of engagement there and that's um, manifested itself in, in U-turns on funeral and, and tangi and, and the public health report. So, so you know, we've, we've seen that lack of a partnership approach here and, um, and yeah, we need to get better of that and we especially need to get better at that in, in, in ordinary times because, um, you know, we need to build in those processes then so when we are in a crisis that, that we abide by those um, and, and respect the treaty. And, and Bridget, do you think this conversation on the constitution might, might frame the uh, next phase of uh, perhaps more transformationally spending the $20 billion of loose change, which is left over? <laughs> I mean, that would be fantastic. Um, you know, that maybe just a slightly po more positive uh, spin on it, you know, relative to um, most of the rest of the world, our level of social cohesion and, uh, and partnership through this crisis has been notable. So, you know, and, and in fact, uh, maybe that's a reason to think more positively about the opportunity because, you know, we've proven that we can do it. Uh, we, you know, we've proven that, uh, you know, our political, our, our um, partisanship can be put aside and that, you know, in spite of the, you know, wrinkles, especially with regard to iwi, that we've not done a bad, or that the government's not done a bad job, but perhaps they could use the experience to take some more steps uh, in, a, in a more collaborative and partnership um, uh, framework going forward. Cool. Good, thank you. That's, uh, that's a really, really interesting issue. Thanks for raising it, Patrick. Um, Emma asks, um, um, where, where does this budget leave the living standards framework? Uh, I, the the uh, finance minister said before the budget, oh gee, we're gonna have to park some of those things that we said we we're going to do in the budget because of this being a, a short-term crisis. But um, is, is, where does the living standards framework sit? In, in this, was, was there a greater opportunity to be able to link it into the living standards framework? And do we need, for example, a change in the metrics that we use to be able to talk about well-being as opposed to uh, GDP and, and other measures? Uh, David, do you want to tackle that one? Yeah, I, so, so the living standards framework is an assessment tool. It doesn't necessarily prescribe certain outcomes in and of itself although but 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 what it forces a government to do is to take seriously um, these issues which are often neglected in a, in a more narrow economic analysis so if you're just focused on on financial and economic standard economic measures and like GDP and unemployment levels you're missing out on on social capital and natural capital and and all of these things which underpin an economy and and enable it to, to flourish um, and so, yeah, yeah, the, 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 what, what, what's happened with this budget um, is that, you know, in December, they um, identified five priorities that were derived from the living standards framework and their analysis of what was missing and where the deficits were across all of the capitals. And so those five budget priorities are what the finance minister has, has said were on ice. But that doesn't mean that the living standards framework isn't relevant to the current budget. I mean, that still remains the assessment tool by which we can judge, you know, where the investments have been made and, and, and which parts of those four capitals and, and, you know, its relative weighting towards president well-being and future well-being. So it remains a useful tool for us to an, analyze the budget and, and um, you know, presumably those priorities will come back in time once they've had time to thaw out and we're um, you know, you know, beyond the immediate crisis of the COVID, COVID response. Okay, we're gonna um, wrap up in about five minutes or so. So if anyone's got any burning final questions, please let us know. Um, uh, Abby, what, uh, what's your perspective on that? Are you... Uh, are you hanging out for the living standards framework to, to have been applied or is it yeah. inevitable this is a short term budget? You know, I, I had the same question as Emma, like I looked as I read the budget, I was curious about how it turned it up, how it was turning up, but I kind of arrived at the conclusion it was an assessment tool. So thank you for that, David. Um, <laughs> 
I, I think you, you know, I think it, having come from a sort of background of working with businesses who were quite focused on the sustainable development goals as well, that's always felt like it's a bit of a gap in terms of how we think at a national level. Like there is this opportunity to align ourselves to international frameworks and make make them our own. And you know, I saw a lot of appetite for that from business. So for me, the living standards framework is useful. What I would like to see is what's the framework for and um, how you how you create a framework which allows the community sector, business, academia, whoever it is, to partner with government to deliver those outcomes that that feels like it's missing, which could be part of a bigger strategic piece. So that's not quite in the living standards framework, but you know, in kind of related framework areas. Bridget. Um, final final comment. So just um, think that's a great comment, uh, Abby, on the SDGs. Uh, it does seem that there's you know some really really useful uh, work that could be done as as framing devices within New Zealand, and it does give us the ability to benchmark against other countries, but also you know with regard to uh, to to those goals. But but in addition, putting measurement around them, um, which we, which to a large extent ha hasn't been been done, uh, is is also a, a a terrific opportunity to focus. And you know, maybe we can we can push for that in the next uh, in the next go around here. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good point about the the connection with that. And one of the things I observe in the budget is there's not a lot there that is going to get the private sector to behave differently towards sustainability in the environment. That, that actually one of the things you'd quite like to have the budget do is, is alter the incentives to be able to provide business with incentives to do things differently that have more public benefit. Uh, and given the, the area that Mindful Money works in terms of investment, we're looking for the government to actually uh, be able to promote a long-term view, a, a, a long-term public benefit, uh, a, a more ethical framework. Um, and in a way, it would have been good to see some of that in, in the budget. Um, you'd normally do that through tax settings as well as, as spend, uh, as well as policy. So, you know, there's still opportunities to do that, but... Uh, uh, but that would that would be the an area that relates again to saying, you know, don't we want private investment to be flowing in areas that are going to contribute to the SDGs, not just a question of government spending. Exactly. Uh, David, any final burning comment? Yeah, I think you've got one. <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing that struck me is is that, is that there is an opportunity as well to to steer things towards that sort of sustainable development that we want to see by the government using its power of procurement and its power as, as purchaser yeah. of some of these outcomes. Because, uh, you know, while it gives you, the, the, the budget gives you this, this broad brushstroke sense of where the money's going to go, you know, there's a lot unsaid about the detail. And the government could well come in and, and require um, you know, certain infrastructure or certain goods to be consistent with Best environmental practice and and to use its power as a as a, as a procurer of, of goods and services to really insist upon best practice. I mean, you know, even some of the things like what like roads. You know, I mean, I have this ambiguity about it because you know we also need roads for electric vehicles. We need roads for micro mobility. You know, there is emerging technologies to have um, roads. You know, made with tar seal which doesn't, um, you know, you know, which is used from recycled concrete and so on, which doesn't have as, as high a carbon emissions footprint. So, you know, it, it, it could insist upon those sorts of things or, you know, even with the environmental jobs and the natural infrastructure that's been built to, to think in the long term about how this might um, have some independence, you know, there's ideas around biodiversity credits and biodiversity offsetting and the ways that um, private companies might participate in encouraging these sorts of outcomes in the long run. And so, you know, perhaps this public investment could lay the foundations for something that's more self-sustaining of that nature in the future. So, so yeah, some of that creative thinking could in a way turn, um, you know, have a green lining in some of what's been announced today. Cool. Very good. Final comment, Abby? Yeah, I just love what David's just said. One of mm. the things, I noticed as I was reading the budget is, is a nervousness around um, green investment as a silo in its own right that 
you know, that kind of making things, you know, that we'll have a climate change project and it will somehow be separate from roads that actually the, the need for us to think about how we build roads or other infrastructure in a climate friendly way just gets ignored like it's that it, it, it was a wondering but the, there's nothing that suggests that the, the how of sustainable or climate will be in the kind of infrastructure thinking so um, and I and I think the other thing from what David said as well is that how because one of the things which becomes difficult I think for business is you know there's plenty you know I've worked consistently with businesses that so want to be part of creating a better future but it's really difficult even for our large businesses to do this stuff at you know at scale the kind of R&D and the innovation that's needed isn't necessarily available to them as, um, as a business on their own and so the opportunity for government to use its procurement but also its ability to catalyze innovation and investment and partnering around some of those shifts would be really powerful as well like how can it be at the center of introducing some of the innovations without necessarily having to do the delivery that that opportunity to be the kind of um driving the innovation or at least helping bring it here or get it kick started feels really useful because i do think there's appetite like i'm looking at the screen and seeing people who i've worked with who i know have got so much appetite for doing this for business so um i feel good about the fact that there are people who want to i think there are just barriers for doing it even though they've got the appetite you know it doesn't have to necessarily be incentivized by money. That's other thing. Yeah, I should have said thank you very much to to all our audience on on Zoom. I also recognise a lot of a lot of your names on on screen, and uh, you're fantastic people who have a an important part of this story. So thanks very much for uh, being in the conversation. Uh, particularly thanks to to three panelists. I thought thought you guys just made such good comments. I really enjoyed that. Um, so thank, thank you all very much. That was, that was great. Um, so next week, uh, 4 p.m. on Thursdays, uh, you're invited back here again. Um, and we're going back into the world of, of ethical investing, talking to uh, Dr. Roger Spiller. Roger is one of the pioneers of ethical investing in New Zealand and uh, is a financial advisor, kind of leading light in, in the field. So please come back and join us it's about managing your money in uncertain times and something that we should all be thinking about. Um, thanks again for joining us. Um, and we'll put a, a, uh, a recording of this up on the Mindful Money uh, website and, and on YouTube. And I'll, uh, I'll try and write a, a short summary, although summarizing this discussion is going to be pretty much impossible. Uh, so. Thanks again to the panelists and thanks to all for, for joining us.